Human Rights Watch has done extensive research on the Sudan's war. Let's start off with your findings on the impact of the war on children. Well, this war has been devastating, particularly for young children. In almost every piece of research we do, we see children are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of this conflict. And that is evident in the use of sexual and gender-based violence against women and girls. We have documented cases of young girls being raped, including raped repeatedly, both in Darfur, um, particularly in the city of El Jenena, where sexual violence was targeted against members of the Masalit community, but also in Khartoum, Umdurman, and Bahri, where Human Rights Watch did uh, work talking to providers of care who found cases of uh, young girls being raped by RSF fighters. Uh, but it's not just, of course, sexual violence. Children's in education has been interrupted, their access to immunizations and regular vaccinations. The psychosocial impact of this conflict is undeniable. Uh, we've also heard reports of the use and recruitment of child soldiers. Uh, and I think perhaps most worrying of all are the famine conditions, uh, which have been confirmed in Zamzam camp for internally displaced people in Darfur, where we know children are starving to death. We know that the indicators for malnutrition are sky high. And little kids, you can see it uh, with their arms being measured uh, with that very classic look of famine tape, are the ones who are bearing the brunt. Now, Akshaya, as a result of this war between the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces, as you mentioned, millions of people are facing acute hunger and others are staring at starvation. What can be done to increase the aid available at this point to the hungry people in Sudan? The biggest thing that needs to happen right now is more access for humanitarian aid workers to consistently move both across lines, that means across territories that are controlled by different fighting factions, and also across borders, which means into Sudan, from Chad, from neighboring South Sudan, from Egypt, wherever needed for humanitarian aid delivery. Uh, there was a big breakthrough with the authorities confirming that the Adre crossing between Chad and Darfur, which had been closed for many weeks, uh, if not months, uh, will now be held open for three months. Uh, but we still need to watch to see if trucks are able to cross consistently and given the permission to deliver the food to the people who are hungry. Uh, but it's not just about crossings. We are also deeply concerned about the looting of humanitarian warehouses, about the attacks on aid workers that make it harder and harder for people who are trying to save lives to do that because they themselves are being put in jeopardy. This is a phenomenon we have documented right. both sides, the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces have been involved in. Akshaya, today marks a very significant day in Sudan, 500 days since this war began. What trends stand out for you? Well, for me, the three things that stand out are first that we are facing this conflict, this war, and these atrocities because of cycles of impunity in Sudan. The two men leading the fighting forces, General Burhan and uh, Mohammed Hamdan Hameti, they both had uh, a hand in being the architect of atrocities back in the early 2000s. And one can only think if there had been justice then for those crimes, we might not be in the situation that we're in now. But but the other issue is global inaction in the face of a protection vacuum. I think more and more you hear that no place is safe in Sudan for a civilian, and that's because no one is standing up for civilian protection. And so we at Human Rights Watch are very keenly watching the discussions happening both at the African Union level in Addis Ababa and also in New York as the UN and the AU evaluate how they might step in to create spaces for protection, to allow for the delivery of of humanitarian aid and to create some sense of safety for Sudanese. Uh, and uh, quickly, uh, Akshaya, it's just a few days uh, since Senator Ben Cardin sent a letter to the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres asking for efforts to be redoubled in Sudan in the wake of this declaration of famine. What would a change how the presence of the United Nations uh, have if they were present inside Sudan? 
Well, we know, of course, that the UN had a mission in Sudan until the end of the year last year, when the Sudanese authorities told them to leave. Uh, and what we're hearing increasingly from our Sudanese partners, from human rights defenders, from women's rights defenders, is they want to see uh, international presence back in the ground in Sudan. They remember the benefit it provided for women in Darfur, even the accompaniment on patrols so that they could safely gather firewood, so they could cook for their families or get the water they need for bathing, eating, and drinking. Uh, they know that green zones or um, police uh, could play a role in enabling the delivery of humanitarian aid, and that locally mediated ceasefires could be uh, even now, as the negotiations continue at the national level, these locally mediated ceasefires could be monitored by external forces to try to provide that semblance of stability. And so I think that letter from Senator Cardin, it's very important. It shows U.S. lawmakers are engaged, they're watching the situation in Sudan. But what we need to see next is action, action from the Security Council and the African Union Peace and Security Council to respond to the dire situation that we're seeing in Sudan today.